All right, good afternoon, Calgary. Let's try again. Good afternoon, Calgary. The Flames are going to win the Stanley Cup. All right. Oh, shoot. Somebody, tough crowd. So it's always fun presenting on the last day of the conference. And I'm just two sessions or last session before everyone goes, goes home, right? And even more importantly, it's always fun presenting after a guy who just showed you how to hack the daylights of everything. So I'm just going to make sure my iPhone is not hacked. Yeah, it looks, looks as though it's good. All right. So um, next slide. Next slide. So I, gotta, oh, I'm, I can see that there. Oh, yeah, right. So in terms of an agenda today, um, so first of all, I work for IBM. I'm a cybersecurity architect. Um, I work with customers in Western Canada as well as Eastern Canada. I like to euphemistically say I'm from Eastern Alberta, which is in Markham, Ontario. Don't hold that against me. Um, and in particular, what I do for IBM is that I, I speak, obviously, IBM lingo and some other foreign languages like Microsoft and those gifts that keep giving, right? So what I want to do today is to touch on a topic that everyone and their brother is, is talking about, which is AI, um, the good and the bad. That's the title of, of the presentation. It is not about hacking. So if you guys are expecting hacking, this is the wrong session. This is about how do you defend against the bad guys, right? Uh, we're going to talk about, initially, if you, uh, you know, I had a nice video to show you, but we're not going to show you that today. We're going to talk about the threat landscape as it exists today. We're going to talk about security for AI and then AI for security. And this will become a bit clearer as we go through the presentation. Um, we're going to talk about how IBM is addressing this problem that we're going to, you know, that we'll get into in a few minutes. Um, and then what's next? What are we doing to really move the ball forward to address the problems that I'm about to show you? So again, next slide. Um, this is a great video. I uh, don't know if you've ever seen it. I showed this at the B-Sides Edmonton conference, and one or two people have seen it. You've seen it, sir? This is a fantastic video because it shows you the power of AI in terms of just basically compromising someone's identity. So how many of you have something like this, you know, where it's locked and I do this and it opens? How many of you have one of those? Yeah. You feel very confident after watching that video when you see this? So I need not go further because if you were here in the previous presentation, which I caught the tail end of, I want to throw this damn thing in the, in the garbage now because it's, it just, oh, it's actually working. No, just can't get the audio. Oh, you can't get the audio. All right, never mind. Let's skip to the next one. Okay, so uh, look it up on Google and now uh, watch it because it is an extremely compelling video, right? Even Morgan Friedman is an older gentleman. You know, he's got some little things on his face and so on. Even the shadows is awesome. And why that's a problem is this. The next slide, right? So deep fake voice, this is something you can go on the internet. Um, speechified, it, it, you know, it's got this thing. Um, you, next click. In the next click, you'll see, um, actually, this one is free. It's a free deep fake voice generator. And it's from um, the URL. I can't see it here, but you can have, maybe you can see it. URL is there. You can actually try it out for yourselves. Um, yeah, and this thing is free. Right, so think about that, right? We have, you know, with respect to the biometrics, we've got, you know, deep fakes in terms of video. We've got deep fakes in terms of voice. You know, they can pretty much say whatever you want them to say. Uh, all it takes is 100 words. So how many of you have Facebook? where you've told everyone and, the bro and their brother you know, that you've had a great uh, vacation with your girlfriend, your wife, or whatever, and you've, uh, you know, have audio and video and explaining how wonderful it was. Um, I was speaking to a colleague earlier, and she's going to Cuba, and she may put the stuff on Facebook because it's going to be a great vacation. 100 words, that's it. And they can clone your voice. Next click. All right, and so this is the problem. 
the problem is that in some institutions, like in this example here, the bad guys were able to clone a director's voice and they got $35 million, right? Because biometrics is voice, face, you know, fingerprint. Um, there's a certain president in the United States, ex-president, I should say, former president, who does a lot of this, waves his hands. How confident you think, after watching some of this stuff, you are that you couldn't get a high-powered camera and get a copy of this fingerprint? Yeah, you can do it. You've done it, Brady? OK. So the president likes to do this. And he's the guy that has the, his finger on the nuclear, nuclear button. So scary stuff. So that is the problem we're trying to address. So go to the next slide. All right. So this is some stats from IBM. Uh, we do a study of about 500 uh, customers around the world. And these are some of the numbers that you see here in terms of the problem from a global perspective that we're that customers around the world, including right here in Canada, is, is, uh, is experiencing. So ransomware is still, a, is still a thing. It hasn't gone away. It's just getting better and better, right? Just t this Tuesday, yeah, this Tuesday. Anyone heard of a thing called Patch Tuesday? Yeah, Patch Tuesday? Did, did you read the latest one, what they did? They patched three vulnerabilities that were, in my opinion, those were zero days. And then the, the point here is that each one of those vulnerabilities allowed the bad guys, by the way, Microsoft admitted that it was exploited in the wild, right? So it's not a, an academic thing. Each one of those allowed system admin access. If you, if you don't believe me, I'll show you the article, right? Happened this past Tuesday. So that's, that's the problem, right? Phishing is still a problem. And by the way, the, AI guy, the, the guys are using AI right now to develop very, 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 very convincing um, phishing attacks, spare phishing attacks. So it's no longer your brother's friend, cousin, who had a, you know, who was a, a former prince of Nigeria that has $100 million. That stuff is old stuff. Now it's a very sophisticated, multi-stage attack. The bad guys are going to send you an email, introduce themselves, they don't want anything. Right? It's just establish a conversation, make sure you're comfortable with it. They'll tell you something interesting. You don't have to click on anything. Yeah, but you get an email, okay, fine. Next email, next email. About a fourth or fifth email, you're done. You don't even have to click on it. Right? The fact that your, your browser, not your browser, your Outlook or whatever you use for your email uh, does preview, that's the vulnerability they're exploiting. And you're dead. Don't believe me? Google something called I tell them what it is? It's an Israeli company <laughs> that has this thing. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real problem. All right, so those are the numbers that you see there. Um, the next slide here is, sorry, yeah, go, go to the next number. Um, we, we, did, we surveyed, um, this is IBM again, research. We surveyed 200 uh, customers, CIOs, and we asked them some questions about AI. And you see those numbers there, right? 64% of customers out of the 200 are facing a lot of pressure to adopt AI, 64%. In other words, everybody and their brother, to use that euphemism, is approaching AI in some shape, way, or form, right, in their business operations. Um, but they're concerned about the risks. 84% are. And so AI has been it's, it's a great opportunity, right, from, from a usability, from a, you know, speed to a new, new, new function, new, new uh, business uh, utilities, new business uh, um, products. It's a great thing that everybody is using, but it's, there's some problems with it. And these 200 uh, customers that we sur surveyed identified that they need some defenses because they're worried about this. They're really, really worried about this. And this, this research is uh, 2023. You got the link below in the, in the slide. They're going to get a copy of these slides, right? Yes. OK, perfect. All right, next slide. OK, so what then is the real problem from a, uh, an attacker's perspective? Or sorry, on a defense perspective? The last session was about how you break things in, how you break into things. This session is about how do you protect things. 
So the, the attackers will do two things, two main things. They will target the AI, and they will use AI to target you. In a nutshell, right? That's what's happening. So if you, if you how many of you have done cybersecurity training? You know, you, you heard about the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, availability, uh, integrity. Great. Um, the new attack surface is the AI itself, the AI models. You know, whether it's Google's, what's it called? Uh, Bart, Bard, Bard, B A R D, right? Or it's Microsoft Copilot or whatever, uh, Anthropic um, for AWS. They they have something called. Um, just having a, have a, it's late in the day. Uh, anywho, um, every single model is, is at risk, is what I'm saying. And so the way they're using it, and we'll go through in some details, you see some examples. They're, really, they're using it to do prompt injection. So there's a kind of a there's, a, there's a thing called prompt engineer. You guys heard about that? You actually can become a prompt engineer to figure out how to use these things more effectively. All right. Looks like I said something. So. <laughs> and then, all right, so in terms of how they're going to use it um, to, to defeat you, or they're going to actually use AI to generate, as we discussed earlier, better and better phishing attacks, better and better uh, code, right? Using AI to generate code. Um, attackers will actually use AI to, you know, evade your defenses. So those are the two uh, perspectives I, I wanted to share with you. So in the next slide then, sorry, you had a question? Inside, right? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, it's about using AI, not not for nefarious reasons, but using AI internally for, yeah, like, like for good use. Good, good use as well as like, you know, people are learning about like, day to day they're using AI. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like All right, we didn't plant, she's not a plant, uh, so that's the next slide. <laughs> All right. Sorry, before we get there. So IBM has two approaches, right? There's security for AI and AI for security. So let's just jump to the next slide. All right. So here's how the bad guys are misusing AI. And we're going to get, get into some examples. Next slide. So if you think about it, right, an AI model, the way it's built is that you have a data collection. I'll get to your question in a sec. Uh, they, they've got an AI model that's developed, right, usually you know, the data scientists, they're very smart guys, but they tend to use a lot of open source, open source models that um, are widely available and used by the data science community around the world, right? So that's kind of how they start off. And then of course they tune it and they add more stuff to it. They use the internet stuff, they use open source stuff. That's kind of how they, they, they do things. Then they start to train the models based on the training data, you know, with some live data, right? And then they, um, you know, they put it to live use, right? Now, the attackers will target that sensitive data that's being uh, unwittingly, usually unwittingly, present in the training data, right? And you'll see an example of that in a sec. Um, they're also building, so we're also building new applications, right? Here at IBM, for example, we don't really have an HR department anymore. We have a HR AI system. You talk to it by, and you know, you ask it questions and it responds. Is it named Karen? No, <laughs> it's, that's not the name. Yeah, his name is not Karen. It's a typical IBM name. Uh, IBM Chatbox. Chat Very, you know. HR Chatbox. HR Chatbox. Yeah, it, it, it is a real thing, right? So IBM, um, I know this call is being recorded, but IBM uh, basically um, encouraged the employees who are HR people to find a new job. <laughs> um, right. And so uh, the, the next piece, of course, is that what we call, what we call model inference. So based on the, uh, the way the AI is, you know, we, we can actually uh, start to, to, based on the training data, you know, it, it will respond to um, live data, right, live questions. 
And so you can use model inferencing to, to hijack up the model. So let's go into the next slide. So you'll see an example of each one of these. All right. So this was something that happened uh, a few months ago. 38 terabytes of data was ex accidentally exposed. And in the fine print, it says there, all caused by one misconfigured SAS token. A SAS application, one misconfiguration. And look what happened on the other side, right? Um, basically, the bad guys were able to, or well, we presume the bad guys, they were able to essentially get personal information, passwords, private keys, 30,000 internal Microsoft Teams messages. That's what they got, from, right, from this one misconfigured SAS token, all right? And so the problem here is that because of this exposure, right, if you're a bad guy, you're able now to essentially inject stuff into this model, into this code. How many of you are using Copilot today and really feel it's a great solution? You are? You sure? Yeah, it's, it's really good, right? OK, let's go. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the next slide. Sorry? I worked there at Obligated CS. Oh, yes, OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not a Microsoft you know, dissing session. This is, this is just telling you what, what the facts are, right? So yeah, you know about this, right? All right. So here's the problem, then. If you're using, and, and just hopefully I'm trying to answer your question now, right? If you're using AI applications that are built insecurely, you know, based typically on these two models, right? Hugging Face and TensorFlow, right? That's kind of. A lot, of, a lot of AI models tend to use those things uh, as, as, as a starting point, right? Um, and they're publicly available. The problem is that bad guys could essentially use you know, these as backdoors into the organization. So you, you're using it for, let's say, your cybersecurity analyst, right? And you're using it to say, tell me about this URL or this hash. Um, and that hash happens to be the, you know, I'm a bad guy, the thing that I developed. You really think it might say, oh, that's a, that's a very bad URL. Don't, you know, take that offline, use your EDR system to kill it and, you know, block the firewalls. This one, you really think it's going to do that? Oops. Oh, crap. I did. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, so this, is called, this is called a supply chain attack, right? And here's the example, right? Dark reading, that example um, is what we're showing there. And let's go to the next slide. Here's another example of when you, so this is about when you build applications in security. Um, this particular one here is how you can trick the AI model, even though it has defenses, even though it has proper defenses. And, and these guys from, um, I think it's the uh, Carnegie Mellon University and their AI you know, gurus. What they did, they appended a long suffix of characters to the prompts, and they basically bypass the, the protections within the AI model. So you really think, do you really feel confident now that this AI solution you're using to learn and to do stuff is really secure? It's a starting point. It's a starting point? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so the attack is called a multi-stage attack, right? I get you to think that it's very trustworthy, and then eventually I kill you. Yeah. All right. I, you know, this this is not IBM saying this. This is publicly available, you know, stuff. I mean, what we kind of know internally is even more nefarious than this stuff. Okay. Next slide. All right, so what's the solution and how do you protect this? You know what the solution is? It's kind of the going back to basics, right? You got to protect the data. Remember the CIA triad? You got to secure the model. You got to secure the usage. Sounds familiar? Data security all over again. Identity and access management all over again, right? Um, you know, tr just, just making sure you do proper hygiene. So IBM uh, last week, we announced a governance, AI governance solution. Because that's the problem, right? The problem is that there's, it's the Wild West. 
It's using these open source models. It's using collaboration from universities and stuff like that. It's using the internet to, to essentially build these things. And then they become business enablers, right? And so what we have to do, we have to go back to basics. Secure the data, secure the model, secure the usage. It's as simple as that. Well, it's simple in terms of the concept, but how you do it, <laughs> the devil's in the details, right? OK, next, next slide. So let's now pivot for AI for security. Now, I apologize. I work for IBM. You're going to see some IBM stuff here. But you know, I believe other vendors are also thinking in the same way. So next slide. All right. So what we have done is that we're using the robot to ha or defeat the robot, right? So it's really our AI versus their AI. And we're trying very, very hard um, to, to, to deal with this problem um, because, and unfortunately, you can't see uh, my screen, but um, I'm going to give you some, some, some statistics here. We, as an IBM company, we, we had no choice but to, but to choose different, uh, a different approach. So IBM has 11 global SOCs, security operation centers around the world. Every day we process 150 plus billion events. That's with a B, billion security events every day, right? From that, we get about 11,000 security alerts every day. It's a large company, but there's no way we can deal with 11,000 security alerts. No way. So we had to essentially use our own cooking, home cooking, dog food, whatever you want to call it, to address this problem, right? And so what we did is that we have AI, the tools, the tools that you see here on, on this slide, um, we're using the same, those same tools. Actually, it's the other way around. We built the systems internally, and then we took the learnings and so on, and the models, and we made them into, put them into our commercial products. So just to give you some idea about the stats, I said 11,000 alerts. About 74% of those is handled by the AI. False positive, we've seen it before, it's a duplicate, blah, 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 and we just deal with it, right, by the AI. The 26, 27%, right, we put that to a queue for manual analysis. But the AI is also assisting in that process, okay? And so out of that, when you, when you look at it from, from at the bottom end, is that about 85% is closed with a combination of AI versus AI-assisted manual intervention and the rest is are, are things that we have to escalate you know, manually, right? We've got to figure out what really went wrong there. And so what we're doing is every time we see an event or an alert that is a problem, we go back and ask ourselves the question, why, is, why did the AI, you know, triaging and, and alerting and so on, why did that not work? And so we take the learnings and we feed that back into the model, okay? So it's, it's constantly learning and constantly getting better and better and better. So we, we had to do this because, as I said, these, these, these alerts are just increasing. Um, our budgets are not increasing. You know, we, we, we can't hire enough people. And so that's, that's what we had to do. All right, so just to show you a little bit more detail in, in what I'm talking about, next slide. So we are using um, AI in pretty much our entire threat management suite, right? Um, so from an attacker perspective, we have something called Randori. Randori is a, is a company, is a bunch of ex-hackers that decided to come good. And so they, made a, they, they formed a company. So the way, the way a hacker looks at, a, at an organization, um, you know, from a URL, a single URL or an email address, they will go to town on that, right? And they will actually penetrate your organization. So that process, that thinking has been automated. And the AI that we built in it is, is able to look at the services, look at the, you know, the environment as we understand it from an external perspective, summarize that, and then present it to a customer using pretty much most of it automated, right? Artificial intelligence. And then from an EDR perspective, yes, IBM has an EDR. We also do the similar things. We look at behaviors. We're not looking at signatures, right? Can I say that gar uh, antivirus, how many of you feel that antivirus is a really good thing? You do? Yeah, I think Microsoft. Yeah? Sure. <laughs> you just, were you here for the previous session? <laughs> All right. Yes, you're right. It, they, some of the EDR systems like CrowdStrike, 
Defender now is, 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 is pretty good, carbon block. Um, anything that relies on signatures, garbage. Absolute garbage, don't even bother, right? It's, it's, it's behavior models that we're looking for, right? Because a zero day will easily bypass an antivirus solution, like it, there's no tomorrow. That's what, that is what we've seen in the field. So those three vulnerabilities I talked about, Patch Tuesday, right? You think your EV would have been effective against those? <laughs> Probably not. So you got to look at different tools. You got to look at the SIM, right, to kind of figure out how things are, 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 are being collected and correlated and so on. So we have a SIM. We have, uh, um, you know, in terms of the AI, and this is what the presentation is all about. We're using the AI in terms of the detection, the triage, the investigations itself, and the response, right? That's what we're doing. So I told you, you know, 11,000 alerts every day. We're using these tools behind the scenes to, to, to handle that. Right. So it's not vaporware, it's real stuff. And it's just getting better and better and better. Yes, sir? Ah, OK, yes. Yes, well, let me, let me answer it this way. We have our own threat intelligence. It's called X-Force. And X-Force is really about 8,000 um, researchers around the world. And what they do on a daily basis is just collect threats. And they put that into the gigantic database. They kind of figure out what's, you know, from a CVS score, you know, which, you know, where they are in the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. And then we push those learnings to these tools that you see here. That's one. But we also have a thing called Granite, which is a large language model built by IBM. So I was just dissing these, land, these LLMs for a while. And I'm about to tell you that we have one of those as well, right? What the hell is this guy talking about? OK, all right, let's skip. skip uh, what, it's kind of late in the day, and I realize uh, you, you know, where I'm standing between you and end of the day. Let's go to the next slide. Um, from a data perspective, I talked about securing the data, right? We have uh, tools that are looking at the actual um, you know, the, the data itself. Who has access to that data? We're able to figure out. Um, how the data is being used, and the AI is looking for anomalous behavior, right? Um, one of the problems with, with these large language models, anyone, even including ours, is explainability, right? How do you know that that model is free from code injection? How do you know? Because by definition, right, you remember your AI 101? There are this AI, then there's machine learning, then you've got deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, right? Then you've got uh, large language models, which are generative, AP, generative AI, which is essentially a subset of deep learning. Deep learning, by definition, is you may get the right answer, but you can't really explain it. So how does an LLM guarantee that the, the data, you know, the data, the models, the, the learnings, the, you know, the answer is, is correct? Hard problem, right? So data security is how we use to address some of that. Not all of it, but some of that. Next slide. And then finally, from an identity perspective, right? Who has access to these models? And it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's basic hygiene, right? It's making sure that the, the data scientists, you know, the users, uh, are, are, they, they've got the proper credentials, the proper It's actually not that important to do any DNS uh, spoofing it because there are certain destinations and domains and websites that you might be going to that actually bond or are re result. We got hacked? <laughs> okay, I, I, I did something. I don't know what I did. Oh, <laughs> all right. Keep hands to the side. Don't touch. OK, I'm going to speak like this. For us. OK, next slide. <laughs> that, that, was, that was Freudian in terms of how it got. So make a long story short, uh, it's an IBM presentation. We've got AI models embedded in a whole bunch of our security products. Um, the goal here is not to sell you an IBM, but just to show you that we are using AI you know, right across the board, right, from protection, detection, and response perspective. Um, did I, <laughs> were you about to answer me, ask me a question and we got interrupted? Sorry. Okay. Uh, no, the gentleman at the back. Okay, all right. So next slide. Okay, and yeah, next slide. Okay, um, 
where I want to go with this is how we are about to use AI to actually you know, take a next leap forward. And to do this, we developed uh, a large language model called Granite. So finally, IBM for, you know, we have, we, we have these product names, IBM, blah, 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 blah. Now we have a product called Granite. So Granite, if you understand the meaning of the word, it implies something solid, something you know, rock solid that, that is unbreakable, and so on. So we've developed over the years a granite foundation model, a large language model. And what makes it special is that we did not train it with internet data. We did not. We did not use these open source data that hug and face and TensorFlow and other, you know, other kinds of uh, open training data. We did not. What we did is that we used, it, we used the training data that we have developed from a large organization like ourselves. And we also used customer data of course, we anonymized the data to enhance the model. So right now, the model has about 3 billion parameters. Um, we're also leveraging, to some degree, uh, Meta Llama, right? Um, yeah, so that's what we've done. And the other thing that we did is that we do not have a version of Granite that's exposed to the internet, right? So we've made sure that it's completely uh, isolated from the internet. Um, I gave this talk in B-Sides Calgary, no, B-Sides Edmonton a few months ago, and I said it's secured, and one customer, one person said, how is it secured? I said air-gapped. Oh, well, air APIs, and everybody laughed. Why? Because there was a woman who was a hacker. This, in the morning, she gave a very good presentation on how to hack APIs. So <laughs> what I'm about to tell you is that we're using you know, internal security controls, I don't, really don't know what they are, to preserve the integrity of the model, all right? And we're using it, uh, we, our products, you know, that we've just announced. We've got a code generator built on, on Granite. We've got our security tools that is using Granite. And so how we're gonna use it, we're gonna use it for, uh, as it was really intended to be, right? Interpreting machine data, it's a bunch of, it's a boatload of data coming towards you. Wouldn't it be great to say, Tell me what the problem is in simple English. I don't want to see 59 million log entries and pointing me left, right, and center. Just tell me what the problem is. And also tell me what the fix is, right? And do it before I come into work on Monday morning, right? If you have to take the CEO's machine offline, do it in a nice way so that I can keep my job. That's what you know, we're trying to achieve with this AI, okay? So um, accelerate the threat hunting, all that stuff. We're using it, but it hasn't really matured to the point now where we can talk to it by natural language. That's the next step. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, and there's the some of the details, right? So anything that is about um, automating uh, routine tasks, mundane tasks, that's how we're using the AI. Um, we wanna go from reactive to proactive. Right? So something bad is happening in Asia. Does it affect me as a customer, right? As a, an oil company in, in Calgary? Um, I'm going to say yes and no. You d here's, w here's why I'm saying that. Because the AI is getting better and better and better. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. This guy that presented before me, you want him to be doing the pen testing. Not every day, but maybe once a year, right? But you can use the AI to do automated testing or automated pen testing on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. If you've got sensitive uh, operations, your, your upstream or downstream gas operation, operator, right? You want to make sure that nobody's really accessing your, your, your infrastructure, your OT infrastructure, right? So you can use these, these tools in an automated way to test for, for any exposures. People come, people go, things change, right? New equipment is added, right? One misconfigured SAS token resulted in 38 terabytes of data, right? So that's why you would want to use the automation for more regular assessment. And then hire Henrik or somebody like him to do that deep 
you know, type of pen testing. Make sense? Like, at this point in time, I would not recommend you stop that. Make sure you get somebody like Henrik, though. He's awesome. OK. All right. So finally, then, um, these are just you know, final slides here. I do want to leave some time for questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Right, great question. So the question, if I understood it correctly, was about um, operational technology, OT, right, especially in this town. So SCADA, ICS type controls, uh, systems, I should say, uh, that are commonly overlooked. Well, we, uh, one of the reasons why it's commonly overlooked is because we can't get the right telemetry, or if we do, we're getting an avalanche of telemetry, right? So we have to use machine learning, you know, some type of automation, artificial intelligence, to make sense of that, right? What's the normal behavior? What's the anomaly? What's that needle among the haystack of needles? Because that's really what the problem is, right? It's a, the data, the telemetry is just so vast. So great question. Um, I wish I had a better answer than that, but I don't think at this point in time we have an AI solution that addresses that unique problem. But I would want to say this with some caution that there's a bunch of researchers that are working on this. Doesn't mean to say we have a solution, but they're working on this. Yes, sir. Logging and getting that information. Um, it, has that improved at all? So, uh, oh, um, so if I understood the question correctly, it's about using logs um, from OT devices, um, and I think you're kind of wondering how effective that is. How is it being used? Is it? Yeah. 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 So. And then yeah. Able to use some of yes. So there's there's a company called Nozomi. There's another one um, that actually have built some solutions with respect to OT devices, right? I think last time I looked at Nozomi, I think they had about 130 something different OT, uh, um, you know, switches and so on. You know, within the electrical uh, generation, utilities, and so on, they, they had some capability there to us to ingest those logs. And so, uh, from a QRadar perspective, which is IBM solution, Nozomi can send us the alerts, not the data, the alerts that they may find uh, as part of that log ingestion. But a, a more generic solution would be, for example, look at the network, right? Look at the network, because at the end of the day, the logs could be obfuscated, correct? I mean, if I'm a bad guy, I would try to remove my, you know, hide my tracks. But the network, usually, uh, Henrik had me thinking, by the way, the network should not or does not lie. So what I want to do is to look for the patterns in the network behavior that indicate something bad is happening. And we have that available today. Now, is it scaling to an OT environment? I got to go research that. I, I'm not sure. But I know it works uh, for a large, well, as I said before, IBM, we use our own home cooking. We've got 350,000 employees in f uh, 100 and something countries around the world. We're using it internally. So I know it works. Yes, sir. How do you envision the future of the security operations center? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. I've been speaking to students every day um, but in, when I was in Edmonton, and I'm, I was only here today. And the, the first advice I want to give uh, students is if you're applying for a job at IBM or Microsoft or wherever, don't just tell me you've done this course and that course. Tell me how you're using or what knowledge you have about our solutions. Because at the end of the day, I work for IBM, right? You work for Microsoft. So you got to go and learn about our stuff, right? But what, you, what we want to hear is, um, you know, you have 
played with Copilot or Granite or whatever, and uh, this is what I understand about it, and this is how I think I can use it. And this, by the way, here's where I, some things I, th I think you, you need to be more cognizant of, right, from a you know, next steps perspective. If I got a resume like that from a student, I want to talk to that person. Make sense? Because it shows you know my stuff, or you have an all, some knowledge, you know where the future is going, and you, may, you have some ideas to make it better. We don't know everything, right? You guys do. So with respect to what the future is for the SOC operations, is going to be using these tools intelligently, right? I've got this problem. I've seen ransomware. I've seen a data exfiltration attack. Help me understand, you know, what's the prompts that you need to ask the model, right? Help me understand the nature of this attack, how pervasive it is. Where else have you seen this, right? What do I need to do to fix it, right? Help me generate a response, a playbook response to address this particular problem. Is it a zero day? Is it a, one of those three Microsoft problems that we talked about, right? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So the question is, what? That's a great question. I I really don't know. Yes. So as I said, IBM we have eleven global socks, and they're around the world. Right, so for example, um, something bad happens, that incident, that alert, right, is, um, they're, they're, you know, the guys in Australia would look at it and if they're, you know, at the end of the day, it gets moved to Europe and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, so our EDR models, um, I didn't explain this to you, but the way our EDR works, I'll use that as an example. The agent lives on endpoints, right? And then the hive, which is where the AI, you know, smart logic is, is happening. That's also an AI system that lives in the cloud. So these, these particular um, agents, as they report, they can function by themselves. They don't need the internet, right? Yeah. So they will, they will learn the behavior. The TD.com. Something maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever the agents discover, um, they will, when internet connectivity is, is, goes back or gets reactivated, it will tell the hive this is what happened. And then so the, 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 the models, again, are dynamically adjusted. Some of the models are supervised. And so we, then we will push, um, you know, in, in near real time, the, the uh, augmented models. So, Make sense? So you talk about like offline, like Lama, Baka kind of AI, where they all uh, offline. Yes, the, 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 agents, the agents operate autonomously. It could be, or it could be on a plane, or it could be on the beach in Montego Bay, right? So the, I can install LLM on Montego Bay and be able to know that you have Yes. Yes, yes. It operates independently. Yes, independently. And as soon as it gets connected back to the hive, that's when the learnings from that particular agent gets reflected there. And then the hive will adjust its models and say, oh, I found something new or whatever. And then it will push it to the other agents. Okay, thank you. So Vincent will be here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, this is, um, yeah, because we... Okay, um, we do have a demo, guys. I, thank you so much for waiting. It's Friday afternoon, but um, we do have some prizes. Um, and so please give uh, the lady there um, a Starbucks ticket because she asked a good question. Uh, gentleman at the back there, uh, and the lady at the back there. Come and see, come and see the guy with the prizes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we do have a demo. Is it on December 8th? Yeah. Okay, and uh, we have... Um, yeah, where is it?
Okay, um, come and see me, or we have these in our in the real presentation. You're going to get there's a QR code here, and we're going to give you a demo of the of what I was trying to show you earlier. Okay, um, I know it's a QR code, but it's IBM, so if you trust us, trust me, it's it's good. <laughs> yeah, after watching that guy's presentation, I'm I'm really worrying about my phone now. <laughs> I know, no, no, you're right. There's a thing called, is it called Cushing? Cushing? Cushing, yeah, it's a real thing. So don't click on QR codes, especially when you go to a restaurant and they say, click here to access our menu. Yeah, right. Just use someone else's phone. Yeah, exactly, yeah, use someone else's phone. Yeah, the server, yeah, let's use your phone. All right, thanks so much, guys, appreciate it.